going to be a huge upward tailwind for financial assets. So I think this crash up continues until Congress changes its mind on, on the fiscal policy, but I don't think that's that's happening anytime soon. The way that I look at this is that we are depreciating the dollar in a tremendous way through fiscal spending. And when you depreciate the dollar, assets rise, interest rates rise as well. The risk is not to the left side that something will break. The risk, I think, is to the right side that you will go higher higher than anyone expects. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first, compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're gonna be hearing all about them later in the show, but for now, Mantra, thanks for making this episode possible. Welcome back to another episode of On The Margin, and joining me today is Joseph Wang from fedguy.com. We're recording at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, just a minutes, few minutes after the FOMC press conference just ended. Joseph, great to have you, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And congratulations on joining BlockWorks. Thanks. That means a lot. I've been a longtime listener and reader of you and everybody here. So really great to be on this side of things, finally. You posted a piece on your fedguy.com blog a couple of days ago where you had mentioned an inclination for a global rate cutting cycle to begin and for basically the Fed to be less restrictive in your words. Um, we just finished the FOMC meeting and there's a lot to unpack there, but based with that context, I'd just love to hear what was the most important components of the overall morning from your side. So before we get into what happened today, let's level set a little bit. So the last time we had an FOMC meeting was in March. And at that time, the Fed's dot plot guided towards three rate cuts this year. But between then and now, We've had inflation data basically being a bit stickier than the Fed expected. And so Chair Powell, a few weeks ago, basically went out of his way to say that he's not happy with progress on inflation. And since then, I think the market has adjusted their expectations. And heading into this meeting today, uh, the market was expecting, let's say, about one and a half cuts this year. After the CPI data, they changed to about two cuts this year. Now, the Fed's dot plot, I think, to me, surprised me in that it was more hawkish than I expected. So I was also thinking that the Fed's dot plot would have about two cuts this year, but it actually only had one cut. And that's not the only thing that was hawkish about it. If you look at the dot plot, I think there are two other things in addition to just one hike, one cut being penciled. So the Fed revised its neutral rate up by 0.2%, so from 26 to 28 and the Fed also revised up its long-term uh, unemployment rate. So these two additions I think of as hawkish uh, because when you're, so the neutral rate is basically the benchmark by which the Fed judges whether or not policy is restrictive or not. So if policy is above the neutral rate, then they're slowing the economy down. If policy is below the neutral rate, then they are being accommodative and trying to boost growth. Now, when they revised up the uh, long-term neutral rate from 2.6 to 2.8, what they're saying is that, you know, actually we were not as restrictive as we thought. And maybe that's part of the reason why they're only penciling in uh, one cut this year. Now, the other thing that I thought was pretty hawkish was uh, they revised up their long-term unemployment rate. So the way that I look at this is that the Fed is a dual mandate central bank, full employment and price stability. But usually there's a trade-off between these two. If you, let's say, hike rates to 50%, you're going to kill inflation, but you're also going to push unemployment up. Now, if you think the long-term neutral rate, long-term unemployment rate is 4.2, so a bit higher than 4.1, that means that you know you have some ways to go before you really need to think about this trade-off because the unemployment rate is currently about 4%. So that was, I think, a few hawkish surprises in the dot plot. The Prince conference, uh, I didn't find it too interesting. I, I felt that Chair Powell seemed a bit flustered, and it, it wasn't super. It wasn't. It wasn't a super productive conference, I think, except one comment that he made, which which stood out to me. Uh, many people were asking him, you know, why don't you just cut rates or something like that? And he's like, yeah, if we cut rates, basically the market would surge, and that would uh, that would unleash um, that would loosen financial conditions significantly which is totally true. So maybe that's why he's been trying to hang on. I mean, I don't know if it's been very helpful. Uh, looks like the market just kind of bets on him. Uh, is just kind of betting at that the easing cycle will begin imminently. Sure, when he actually does it, it's probably going to get worse, but I mean, people are speculating on it anyway. 
One thing that was interesting is in the uh, statement that came out at um, 11 a.m. Pacific was that he had they had swapped the the language being about uh, from lack of further progress on inflation to modest further progress. Do you wait that that much, or is that just a, a small little change in the language? So you know maybe that's in recognition of the data we got this morning, right? So um, so CPI this morning was better than expected. The month over month headline was actually 0%, which is very good. But as you know, the Fed's target is not CPI inflation, it's PCE. Now, PCE is you know slightly different from CPI in that you have different components, different weightings and so forth. But a lot of the things in CPI pass through into PCE. And looking at the Cleveland Fed's website, which now casts PCE based on today's data, it looks like uh, PCE is expected to be about 2.6, which w- would also mark a decline from 2.7 last month. So that is some modest progress. It's it's not stuck um, at 2.7 anymore, but very modest indeed. But to be clear, though, 2.6, 2.7, that's not that far from 2.0. It seems like, again, like you mentioned, the the risks are becoming more dual sided. It's not the same as, you know, a year and a half ago or whatever, where they could just almost solely focus on inflation. Um, It seems to me like there's a lot of debate about, you know, do they really hold on here and try to get those more lagging components like, you know, shelter inflation and really get those down to that 2% or do they look at the total, like, Powell said a few times in the press conference, the totality of the data, which is saying that, okay, we're weighing this point that's saying that it's not quite a 2% um, due to the lagging nature of shelter inflation. But all these other components are saying that we're, we're getting a lot closer to our goal. Um, assuming that, what's your view for the next you know, 6 to 12 months? Obviously, like we just said in the dot plot, they're forecasting just uh, on, the, on the median dot plot one cut for the year. Do you agree with that occurring or do you see, you know, potentially continued dovish surprise into the year? So one of the things that really surprised me was the market's reaction to the hawkish dot plot. There wasn't really much reaction. It's like the market didn't believe the Fed or the dot plot is losing its power. But usually when you would have a hawkish dot plot, you would expect equity to sell off and you'd expect interest rates to rise. Now, Every market has its own idiosyncratic behavior. For example, looking at the equity markets, there's a lot of hedging activity that goes on in these big events like a Fed meeting. But if you look at markets that are supposed to be very sensitive to um, to what the Fed does, like short-term interest rates or the two-year yield, they didn't really move much to what I think of a, as a pretty different dot plot. So that surprised me a little bit. Now, my own expectation is that Uh, The Fed is not just going to cut once, it's going to cut three times this year. And the way that I see this is that it's going to go through the unemployment channel. Now, Chair Powell has been very clear this meeting and the last that if you want rate cuts, there are two paths to get this. One is I have to feel more confident in the path of inflation. Or two, we have to have an unexpected softening of the labor market. Now, confidence in inflation... You know, I actually think inflation is probably going to be stuck around where it is now for the foreseeable future. If we have a tremendous fiscal deficit, it just doesn't make sense for inflation to go back to to back to two uh, percent. Um, that's actually the the path towards greater confidence. In inflation is actually what say the Bank of Canada and the ECB have have taken to get their rate cuts. If you listen to Governor Tiff Macklin. He will tell you he has more confidence in inflation. And if you look at their data, it has been coming down to just above their target range. If you listen to what President Lagarde saying, she's saying that she has more confidence in the forecasts of her staff. And so she feels confident inflation is coming down. Now, I don't think that's going to be the path for for the U.S. I think the path for the U.S. is going to be a faster than expected rise in the unemployment rate. Now, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about today's dot plot is that whereas, um, you know, a lot the uh, the growth forecast and stuff that that really wasn't changed, but the unemployment forecast also wasn't changed. And they're still forecasting an unemployment rate of 4% at the end of the year. That stood out to me because 4% is where we are today. So are you saying that between now and the end of the year, you don't expect any softening in the unemployment rate? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. Now, if you pull up a time series of the unemployment rate, say on FRED or something, you'll notice that it bottomed 
at 3.4% and has steadily been rising to 4% most recently. It's trending upwards and the unemployment rate historically exhibits some degree of momentum. And that's what the Sam Dudley rule is all about. So to say that from here to, to the end of the year, you won't have the unemployment rate rise when we have very clear indications that demand for labor is softening and immigration continues to be very large. Uh, I think the unemployment rate is probably going to go up higher than the projections. And that's how we can get three cuts later in the year, probably starting in September. Just on the note of the jobs market, something that was really surprising that I heard in the press conference was Powell basically admitting that he said there's an argument that payrolls may be a bit overstated. I know you've done quite a bit of work on some of the the dynamics, unique dynamics in the jobs market right now, um, especially in how that's related to current immigration. What was your reaction when Powell actually explicitly mentioned that? I think that's great that he's acknowledging that there's a lot of confusion about the labor market data right now. So when you're looking at non-farm payrolls, for example, the one we, the print we got last Friday, huge, huge beat in the number of jobs created. Uh, But then again, the unemployment rate rose as well. So the way that the monthly payrolls print works is that it's actually from data from two different surveys. One is the establishment survey where Um, They poll businesses and count jobs. And the other is the household survey where they ask households about their employment situation and demographic information. So the the establishment survey has been showing strong job growth. And note, though, that um, they count part-time jobs to be the same as full-time jobs. So there could be some inflation because of the rise of gig economy stuff like Uber and so forth. Now, the household survey has been showing painting a different picture. Uh, they've been showing much less job growth and also a higher rise in the unemployment. And, but that could also be due to the survey not correctly accounting for uh, the rise in migration. So there's some work by, I believe, uh, the Brookings Institute that suggests that you know this migration thing is biasing That's that the results from that. So there's a lot of things happening rise of the gig economy, tremendous amounts of migration, which as we see on Twitter, it's um, you know millions of people joining, uh, entering the, the United States. So I think that's throwing off a lot of these surveys. But if you do have millions of people joining the labor force, you would expect higher job growth, but you could also expect higher unemployment as well as you have more people looking for work. So uh, I think the data broadly makes sense to me. Now, precisely, I'm sure there are a lot of methodological problems, but obviously adding millions of people into labor force is going to push up the unemployment rate. That, That seems very straightforward to me, and that looks like it's continuing. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first, compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions into Web3. So you guys heard me talk about Larry Fink talking about tokenization. You've seen the clips on CNBC. You know that Larry and BlackRock are very, very excited about this idea. And the reason for that is they're looking at these trillions of dollars of off-chain real world assets. They want to digitize those and bring them on-chain, which is going to be a massive opportunity. But in order to do that, they need a compliant L1, and that's where Mantra comes in. Mantra has been steadily climbing the ranks and now stands among the top four RWA projects on CoinGecko, which is representative of its rapid growth and influence in the tokenization space. Mantra is built using the Cosmos SDK, so they have some very cool stuff out of the box. They've got IBC interoperability. They also leverage Cosmwasm smart contracts. Very cool design from an architectural standpoint. The next phase on the blockchain's testnet is Hongbai, so that's launching soon. So if you're uh, a dApp developer or something like that, there's a lot of very cool opportunities for you. And I highly recommend that you click the link at the bottom of the show notes. I don't know that I sent you. Uh, Thanks very much again, Mantra, for making this possible. And again, guys, click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Shifting gears from the outcomes from today's meeting, I know that you've had a call and you had a previous uh, interview with Jack Farley on Forward Guidance a few months ago where you articulated your view of a continued equities uh, melt-up. Considering the fact that the the U.S. is going to be later stage to the cutting cycle, it sounds like you still believe more so that there's going to be more cuts than what they anticipated in their dot plot. But overall, they're they're a bit slower to the game compared to others, you know, central banks. If that were to cause further, you know, U.S. dollar strength, how does that affect that thesis? Where do you stand on it? And also, where do you stand on the fixed income side of things as well? Like you mentioned in uh, my chat with Jack Farley earlier in the year. I thought that we would crash up. And the reason for that is the tremendous fiscal spending that we're doing. If you are doing 
fiscal de- spending, let's say a fiscal deficit of about 6% a year, you know, that's about one and a half trillion a year. Fiscal deficit spending is basically just printing treasuries. You're printing dollars. You are literally uh, debasing the currency. Now, if you are debasing the currency, that's obviously a tailwind for financial assets. So again, when the government spends more than it takes in in taxes, it borrows it. But rather than saying that it borrows it, I think it's more useful to think of it as printing a treasury security. And treasuries are just dollars that pay interest. So if you're doing that at a large scale, obviously it's going to be a huge upward tailwind for financial assets. So I think this crash up continues, continues until uh, Congress changes its mind on, on the fiscal policy. But I don't think that's that's happening anytime soon. Further tailwind, of course, is that what we all know to be an imminent Fed cutting cycle. Now, Fed is going to delay this as much as they can, but it looks like to me at least, that at least one cut based on the dot plot. And if my unemployment thesis plays out, uh, you'll get more. Now, that affects fiscal and fixed income markets a bit differently. So if we have rate cuts, I think initially it's going to be bullish for the bond market. But beyond the immediate rally in bonds, again, fiscal deficit, very large, upward pressure on inflation, that's very negative for the bond market. And so I do think we ultimately sell off. Now, the 10-year could get to 5% this year, depending on the November election. But if not, I have uh, feel pretty confident that next year, or at least in the medium term, that longer dated interest rates have to go up. It just doesn't make sense given the current fiscal situation. You mentioned about how rate cuts could, how, you know, what would be the secondary impact on on the long end of, of of the yield curve, and that's really interesting. I mean, because something I've been thinking a lot about is what is the style of that first cut? Is it a normalization cut, or is it more of a you know economic slowdown slash recessionary cut? So it sounds like if it was a normalization cut, we would get that initial reaction where it's okay, Fed is cutting, you know, go chase and and, and buy bonds. Um, but your view is that because of the continued fiscal situation, that would lead to higher yields later on versus I imagine if it was an outright recessionary cut, that would lead to further flight to safety in the long end and that would protect it. Do you think they're thinking in those terms in terms of what kind of style that first rate cut would be or what do you think? So rate cuts happen in different contexts. So we had big cuts in 2008 big cuts in 2020. Those were when we had a negative shock to the economy, fast cuts, and uh, and uh, you know that had a strong impact on the financial markets afterwards. We also have situations like say in 2019, where we would have, as you noted before, a mid-cycle adjustment, where Chair Powell tech adjusts rates a little bit, just to kind of support the economy a bit, and the markets take off afterwards. Now, right now, it's I, I don't see us as being in a sudden negative shock. We have geopolitical concerns, sure, but right now the path seems to be just, from my perspective, a gradual rise in unemployment. And then the Fed does some more of a slight moderation in policy, given that unemployment is a bit higher. And I would expect that inflation would, you know, at least not go up in the coming months. So I think that's a very different context. Now, in this context, I think rate cuts would be bullish uh, for the market because it's not that you're buffering any extreme negative shock. You're moderating restraints. It'd be more like 2019. Now, to the point about recession. So when you think about a recession, traditionally, it's when you have negative GDP growth, right? The economy is producing fewer goods and services today compared to last year. Now, if you have tremendous fiscal spending, one hand, and of course, increasing population, increasing the workers into your country, no, that, that, that makes the recession difficult, I think. Again, if you're adding more people, you're producing more goods and services, that means GDP growth is going to be positive. So that makes a recession very unlikely to me. You could have a per capita recession where the living standards of the average person decline like you have in Canada. But, um, you know, I think being afraid of a sudden recession, that's that's a different playbook. That That's, you know, the past. If you have tremendous fiscal spending while you're increasing the population, that doesn't seem likely to me. 
yeah, I laugh because I'm in Canada where we are having that issue right now of this uh, per capita recession, even though, uh, you know, aggregate growth is, is, is continuing higher. Following along for the rest of the year, obviously, you know, bullish equities, um, somewhat neutral-ish to higher yields on fixed income. What's your perspective on commodities, um, especially gold and metals, um, and also tying in there Bitcoin? Um, you know, I view those two as as you know sort of similar, but we could start with the with the metal side of things. Yeah. So looking at the metals, well, at the precious metals, it looks like gold has been well bid over the past year. Um, it seems like uh, the bid in gold, at least for the earlier part of the year, has been interest in China and other emerging markets. On one hand, we knew that until very recently, uh, the major central banks, like say the PBOC, have been purchasing gold. There's actually a really interesting study from the IMF looking into this and finding that a lot of the countries that are more that are closer to China, according grouped by how they vote in the United Nations, they've actually been buying more gold and fewer dollars in their foreign reserves. So there is some real foreign central bank diversification. It also seems to be that the broader public in China and other emerging markets have also been buying gold as well. And that's been very supportive. And of course, we also have geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, also very supportive. So those seem to be structural forces going forward that will be supportive of gold. It does seem the world, there is more geopolitical uncertainty, like we have European elections recently it, that changed the political landscape there. Ukraine war seems to be heating up. So geopolitical tensions are going to be with us for a while. And at the same time, now, whereas the People's Bank of China did not increase their gold holdings last month, uh, I suspect that that's just a pause. If you look at what they hold, they don't actually hold very much dollars as a very much gold as a percent of their foreign reserves. So, if they wanted to diversify to have a similar fraction of the reserves in gold as, say, Russia, then they have a lot more buying to do. So, I think that's going to continue. And so, I, I continue to be positive on gold. Silver, another precious metal, it's hard to say because part of it is industrial, but looking at the chart, silver seems to follow gold. Uh, but bear in mind, though, that it is also an industrial metal. Now, Bitcoin, Bitcoin looks really bullish to me, just looking at the chart. Now, it seems like, to me, the biggest headwind to Bitcoin was potential that the government would not like it. Now, that's Bitcoin is a new thing, and oftentimes the government thinks of it, or many people think of it, as a way to facilitate is illicit behavior, money laundering, and stuff like that. Now, recently, though, the political winds seem to be changing. There seems to be more acceptance of Bitcoin. Now, we had President Trump openly accepting uh, donations in Bitcoin, going to the Libertarian Conference, uh, pledging that, you know, uh, crypto is okay. So we also had, of course, ETFs that are now... Uh, you can invest in spot Bitcoin and spot Ether. So there seems to be more institutional acceptance. And if there's more institutional acceptance, then there's bigger investors, larger capital pools, institutional funds will be more willing to adopt it. Uh, looking at some other data, Bitcoin is largely a momentum-driven uh, asset. So you know, this could really snowball into something that's, that's significant. So it looks like it's going to continue to go up from my perspective. Yeah, you had a really unique analysis on your website a few weeks ago, looking at the basically the marginal propensity to, cons to consume of basically uh, crypto traders, and how that trickles into different components of the market. Um, I'd love if you could just unpack that a little, because I, I thought that was a really interesting take that I don't think a lot of crypto native people thought about as much. There's a, some really interesting work being done on just who who the crypto investors are and what they do with their money. Uh, some researchers got a hold of a data set that I, I think had the bank accounts of 60 million people in America. And when you have their bank account data, you can basically see what they're doing with their money. And so they looked through the transactions and looked for people who had transactions to crypto exchanges like Coinbase. And they tagged those people as crypto investors. And so they wanted to figure out, you know, what kind of people are they and what do they do with their money? Now, they had some interesting findings. Well, first off, crypto investors much, much more likely to also have transactions at casinos. So uh, I tend to like to gamble. 
also when Bitcoin prices go up, a lot more people uh, have transactions with crypto exchanges. So again, momentum asset price goes up, interest comes in more and more people interested in it. And also though, as you suggested, crypto investors tend to rebalance, not just to other assets like equities, but also to the real economy like housing. So one of the things that was most interesting to me is that looking just the, the researchers looking at bank account data, they noticed that when a crypto investor has a large withdrawal from the crypto exchange, a few weeks later, they tend to have a much higher mortgage payment. So the inference, of course, is that they're making a lot of money in crypto, taking the earnings and buying a house with it, and hence the, large, the larger mortgage payment. Now, doing some more of a high-level analysis, cross-referencing account zip codes and housing markets, they think that people, uh, the zip codes that have more crypto investors uh, tend to have a higher house price appreciation. So there's some real economy impact over there. Now, aside from assets, Crypto investors also seem to have a higher marginal propensity to consume. So the propensity to consume basically is, uh, let's say you have these unrealized gains, what do you do with them? Do you spend them on real goods and services? Crypto investors appear to spend them at twice the rate as equity investors. So all those Porsches you see with BTC or YOLO, uh, that's a real phenomenon. I doubt the Fed really thinks about that all deeply, but you know some policymakers think about these uh, these wealth effects that occur. Um, and you know whether we've talked about it a few times on on our weekly roundup show, but this idea of generational arbitrage, where you know there's older generations that um, you know made a lot of their wealth through the housing you know boom over the last few decades and that sort of thing, and that's basically made it really difficult for say my generation to get in there. But there's this other you know avenue into into riches do you think policymakers think about that that much or is it just you know it's it's too nascent in its time so they definitely think about the wealth effect but i don't think they think about crypto uh, to be honest if you look at the fed's data it actually doesn't even include crypto in its household wealth I, the crypto data just just it's not there it's not in the system so they could be they could be missing this huge chunk of you know hundreds of billions of wealth uh, in their data set now, when I was at the Fed, uh, our job was to brief Washington D.C. about developments in the financial markets, and we never asked. We were never asked to brief them about crypto. They just don't care. And I understand crypto is, you know, think about it. It's a bunch of boomers in a room, and also people who control the dollar system. The dollar system is much, much, much larger than uh, the crypto world. And uh, from their perspective, I, I think it's just, you know. These kids doing this crazy thing, you know, dog with hat and all that, uh, whatever. It's it's not that important. <laughs> Look, we've done a bit of a, a round trip around a bunch of different asset classes, and I think we both have similar views um, that tending towards bullishness. I'd love to just test ourselves around what would be a compelling bear case, especially for the equities market, because I've seen some you know discussions around higher yields, you know, putting uh, putting pressure on equities. To, uh, you know, if the discount rate is is higher. That brings the valuation lower and that sort of idea. So, you know, what, what do you think is the most compelling bear case, if you could find one? I think the most compelling bear case would be some geopolitical accident. Just looking across the world, I think the risk of some kind of escalation is higher than expected, right? So looking at the Ukraine situation, for example, a year ago, White House was like, we'll never send to Ukraine any tanks. Okay, let me send us some tanks. We'll never send them missiles. Oh, okay, we'll send them some missiles. We'll, but we'll never send them fighter jets. Oh, wait, wait, here's some F-16s. And But we'll never, ever allow them to attack Russian territory. And a couple of weeks ago, they're like, yeah, you could attack Russian territory. So it seems like it's on a path towards escalation. Don't really hear that being talked about. But I also know that markets are not super in tune with geopolitics sometimes. Now, I remember in 2020, we had this tremendous pandemic happening in China, horrific things on Twitter, market continued to go up. It was only after uh, the disease spread to Italy that the market had some reactions. So sometimes the market's not super sensitive to these things. So I think we do have some meaningful risk there uh, that, that's not priced. Now, about the discount yields, and I, and I hear that story a lot, now, I would point to, let's say, Mexico or Brazil or Argentina or Venezuela. You know, they have high interest rates. Uh, let's say Brazil, Mexico, 10% 10-year yield. Stock market continues to go higher. So I think that misunderstands 
how, what's happening. The way that I look at this is that we are depreciating the dollar in a tremendous way through fiscal spending. And when you depreciate the dollar, assets rise, interest rates rise as well. And that that seems to be how I look at this. Um, I don't know, plugging it through a DCF, stuff like that, that just doesn't seem to be how the world works. Hello, hello, listeners of On The Margin. I've got good news for those of you who are in the crypto scene. Blockworks is bringing back Permissionless. We're going to be doing Permissionless 3, and this year we are heading west. So we're moving that out to Salt Lake City. That's going to be October 9th through 11th this year. We've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers for you. So we've got Balaji headlining. We've got Sriram, Munib, Matt Hogan of Bitwise, Jan Van Eck. This one's going to be a blast, guys. And I saw many of you out in London for a DAS this year, and I hope to see you out in Salt Lake for permissionless. And because y'all are such faithful listeners, we've got if you use code margin 10, you're gonna get 10% off your tickets. Appreciate you all. Hope to see you out there. No, no, it really doesn't. Um, it feels like a lot of how the world works is yeah, like ongoing liquidity and, and that sort of idea. Um, for those that don't know, your previous career, like you mentioned, you worked at the New York Fed, you were on their markets desk. So basically, I believe the one that was, you know, when they're doing uh, QT last time around, you were you're in the weeds there doing that. Is there any concerns you see right now in the the plumbing area? Um, it's funny, you know, last month, there was more talk about the QT taper. But I think the only mention Powell had today about any sort of uh, monetary plumbing or QT thing was just in the beginning of his speech, where he mentioned that they're still um, letting assets run off. He didn't even mention the fact that they're at a much lower pace now. But is there any concerns you see in that world? Um, no, or is no. It's steady as it goes. Yeah, it's really, really boring. It's it's really boring. So I think again, what oftentimes we have we, the trap we fall into is that we get stuck fighting the last war, and so that's why I think there there's so many people always predicting an imminent collapse in the equity markets. Uh, Fed is also like that. Right? Traumatized by what they saw in September 2019, where they saw money market rates go up a lot. So this time around, super, super cautious. They want to make sure that they want to move slowly, want to make sure there's plenty of liquidity in the financial system. And so not just are they leaving the level of reserves much higher than before, they have all these emergency facilities that they didn't have before. Uh, the 20, uh, the banking panic and we saw last year is another good example. Again, something happens, just, you know, launch a new facility, pump the system with money. So uh, I, I don't think there, we're going to have anything of concern over there. Again, the risk is not to the left side that something will break. The risk, I think, is to the right side that you will go higher, higher than anyone expects. Yeah, I totally agree. And that that higher being you know largely driven from those fisc fiscal deficits that you mentioned. Um, you know, it's really interesting and perplexing to me, like you mentioned there, um, there's, there's facilities in place now to avoid a September 2019 event, namely, you know, the standing repo facility, which, you know, when I can, when I look at that and I look at, um, you know, like SOFR to interest on reserve balance spreads, there's, there's no stress in the money markets, which to me is, makes it quite surprising that they decided to taper QT as much as they did since they try to say that that's not like an active monetary policy tool for them. It's just mechanics. So to me, it feels like the only thing that makes sense is that they're trying to alleviate the fiscal debt situation. Do you think that's a driver or something to think about, or they're just really worried about a 2019 repeat? Yeah, I think they're just really worried about a 2019 repeating. Um, you know, they have a really bizarre view on QT. They, they you know, keep telling everyone that you know, QT is not no big deal. I mean, QE is a big deal, but QT is not a big deal. But it seems like a lot of it really is just how it's executed. You know, when you do QT, E, you're buying a trillion dollars in five weeks. When you do QT, you're doing like, you know, 50, 60, 70 billion a month. So that's the asymmetry there. Now, they're just being very conservative, I, I think. I don't think the Fed looks at their job as managing the fiscal situation. I, I, do, I, don't, I don't think they're just trying to support the, uh, the fiscal deficit or anything like that. The functioning of the market, yes, but the actual spending... Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. The U.S. government is on a fiat system. It, it can always just issue more treasuries. As we wrap up, we'd just love to hear a bit. Obviously, you mentioned that you're you're fading the dot plot of of one cut and thinking that it's more likely to see you know three cuts by the end of the year. 
Um, any other final takeaways or comments on the FOMC meeting and also the CPI uh, report that came out this morning? You know, we lightly touched on it, but if there's any really interesting nuggets from there as well. So I think one comment, I think it's not being properly recognized in the market is we have the upcoming November election and the two candidates have very different policy views. And I think who gets who gets elected is going to have a much bigger impact on the markets than whatever the Fed is going to do. Now, looking across the world, I think politics is going to be trumping central banking going forward. Uh, for example, look at what happened in Mexico. They had elections and uh, the outcome was not market friendly. We had the peso sell off tremendously. Mexican stock market tr sell off tremendously. In India as well, we saw one of the uh, political parties lose their majority. Market uh, sold off a lot. Now, going forward, looking at President Trump and President Biden, these two people have very different visions of, of how to run the country. Now, President Trump, for example, very obvious, he's telling you, I want low interest rates, I want a cheaper dollar, and I want tax cuts. So he wants to run an inflationary policy. It's very clearly um, going to be much more important than whatever the Fed does. And in fact, maybe he will do something to uh, limit the Fed's discretion. So a Trump victory, I can see easily the S and P going to six thousand, and that is where you get your huge bond sell off to you know five percent or, or so forth. So I think that's a you know fifty percent chance that that could happen. Now looking at President Biden, now again, not so much on the depreciating the dollar stuff, although we still have a very large fiscal deficit. But what President Biden seems to be doing that's very different than President Trump is through the real economy just allowing tremendous amounts of migration. Now that has impacts on say housing, creating tremendous demand of housing. Uh, people in Canada know that well, or you can have downward pressure on wages. And of course you can also think of it as having uh, impacts on social cohesion uh, as well. Now these are huge policies differences that have huge impacts on both the markets and the real economy. Now, writing on top of that topic, that I think diminishes the Fed's importance going forward. Fed, okay, full employment, price stability. What is the, how can you carry out your price stability mandate when the Congress, federal government can just spend tremendous amounts of money and push inflation very high, right? You, you don't really have control. How can you uh, control full employment if you have the federal government just importing tremendous amounts of workers or maybe changing its mind one day and deporting people. So it seems like we're heading towards a world where the Fed doesn't have the tools to carry out its mandate. And that correspondingly means that they will be less important in de determining what happens to the economy and to markets. So I would place more attention on what happens on the November election going forward. Mm -hmm. Do you view that as being more cyclical, as in we are in through a phase and, you know, say a long term debt cycle or something like that, where it just so happens that more of the emphasis gets put on the fiscal and political side of things? Like, or do you view this as more of a secular change that, you know, monetary policy in general is just going to decrease in relevance? Um, or do you view it just more as you know, part of this longer cycle that we're in? I think it's a cyclical thing. So I think usually what happens looking through, this is not the first time we've had the fiscal authorities behaving poorly and creating inflationary policy, right? It happens all, all the time throughout history. Uh, people, government has been, um, you know, basically spending too much and debasing the currency for thousands of years. Usually what happens, people get fed up, discover, hey, in fact, maybe we should do something about this and have an independent central bank. That's really good. And then cycle continues, right? You elect a government that will spend less and enshrine further central bank independence. And then one day you forget how nice it is to have price stability. In fact, it's so smart. If we just spend a little bit more money, everyone feels a little bit richer. Well, let's keep doing that. So it's just an ongoing cycle. Thank you for joining us today, Joseph. And that was really great. And, uh, yeah, definitely aligned with you on the uh, melt-up risk being a lot bigger than the uh, left-tail risk, but uh, we'll see where we end up here. Thanks for having me, Felix. All right.